It took a minute, but we are back. Welcome to module six of the Anamorphic Cookbook. This time, we'll be talking about all things related to rigging and, unsurprisingly, our sponsor is Small Rig, from whom I've been buying parts since the very beginning of my career. Their parts offer great flexibility and room for improvisation, which is key when it comes to anamorphics and low budget. I'll talk a bunch about adapter-related topics too, but no things are easier with full lenses. In this first episode, we'll talk about fine-tuning your rig with small tweaks that provide sensible improvements, such as locking your alignment, the keystone effect, and more. Episode 2 will demonstrate how to achieve faster lens swaps and a variety of approaches to it, so you can pick what works for your setup. In Episodes 3 and 4, we will build a rig for any occasion with info that you can take beyond the scope of anamorphic filmmaking. We'll look at remote monitoring, wireless follow focus, expanded power options, and the impact of using a Mac box. For Episode 5, we'll pivot to mobility and look at rigging a gimbal with an anamorphic setup. Anamorphics are historically heavier than sphericals, and adapter setups tend to be front-heavy, so we'll see how to deal with that. Finally, in Episode 6, we'll cover DJI's Rangefinder Autofocus tool, which unlocks a ton of possibilities for smaller crews. Gotta lock that budget, right? Now enough of introductions, and let's get started. The first key piece of information and gear that we'll need is rails. Rails are a must for reliable rigging. I'll be working with 15mm LWS, which stands for lightweight support, and it's a bit of a wild west, even though a standard system exists. Here's a frame for the standard established by Ari. The center of your lens should be always 85mm from the center of the rails, which are 60mm apart from each other. If the standard was followed, Lens supports, rail mounts for matte boxes, and a variety of other accessories would work a lot simpler. Alas, not everyone follows the standard, so it's good to have versatility, like this base plate that offers adjustable height. For this module, I'm rigging a Panasonic S5 II, and right after the rails and the riser, we'll add a cage to it. A cage offers you both protection and lots of mounting places for handles and accessories that a naked camera will struggle with. Make sure your cage offers at least two points of contact with the camera. This one offers three. The issue with a single point of contact at the bottom is it loosens with time, making the camera wobble in the cage. Wobble equals bad rigging. Under the cage, you also want two screw holes for your base plate. Again for no wobble or rotation. Next, on the road to lens alignment, we'll need to talk about adapters. If you're using a mirrorless system like me, you're likely adapting to EF or PL. So we'll add the adapter to the camera. Now, no matter how snugly this fits, give it a bit of a jostle by trying to turn it. It turns a little, right? There's always a little play at the mount, and that'll translate to skewing your image. Yuck. I once lost almost all my footage for a project because of that. Any good adapter has a foot support, and you want to make sure to bolt that to your base plate. More often than not, the height of your adapter's foot and cage won't line up. Remember we just talked about the lack of standard? The solution to this is to use spacers or these quarter inch or three eighths of an inch adapters to cover the gap and have your plate with one screw under the camera cage and one under the adapter's foot. I'll settle for a PL mount here. Let's add the Atlas Orion 40mm to the rig and look at it on a profile view. This makes me uncomfortable. I can feel the weight at the front of the lens pulling on the mount like a lever, can't you? The PL mount is particularly sturdy in ways that others aren't, but we can still face some keystone effect. You might recognize the word if you ever had a digital projector. The keystone effect is a distortion caused by projecting a flat image onto an angled surface. In a projector setup, you might have the projector pointing up or down and need to compensate. But how does this relate to image acquisition? 
Let's say the sensor is the flat wall where the projection lands and the lens is the projector. If the lens is sagging, the image that should arrive flat onto the sensor will instead tilt forward. Remember flange distance and its effects we saw in modules 2 and 3? The result here is not so much a warping of the image like we saw with the projector, but a warping of the focused field where the top of it falls short of the sensor and creates blurry results. The best way to address Keystone is through lens support. Pick one that's just long enough to work, otherwise you'll have too much going on under your rails. Also pay attention so you support non-moving parts of the lens. Full lenses won't have trouble with alignment, but adapters will. Screwing an adapter onto a taking lens can be a slow, repetitive, stressful process and almost entirely unnecessary. Every time your adapter can be mounted onto the rails, do that. Alignment will always be correct. And if you're using a vintage adapter, the best clamps, such as this one from Rapido, offer ways to be rail mounted. The best approach to alignment is to set it and forget it. I recommend avoiding filter threads to connect lenses as much as you can. Some adapter feature holes that are a quarter inch or three eighths of an inch. And unfortunately, small rig doesn't have a threaded lens support. So my recommendation in these cases is a tilt lens support. The next thing we'll optimize through rigging is coverage. And that might throw a wrench onto your wider taking lens selection. To get the absolute best, we want the rear element of the anamorphic block to be as close as possible to the front element of your taking lens. Lenses with recessed front optics can be a nuisance, so you want to ensure you're not adding unnecessary space between them. This is particularly important as you get closer to vignetting. On your wider setups, a slim step ring can be the defining factor between dark edges and clearing a wide shot. If you care about how wide does it go, you care about the distance between your scope and your taking lens. On the next episode, we'll look at speeding up lens swaps, anamorphic jackets, and streamlining your adapter rig, so it can be set up and used as flexibly as a single lens setup, eliminating some of the quirks that adapters impose. Stay tuned and subscribe to get a notification when the episode is up. As before, members of the channel get early access to the videos and other resources such as exclusive downloads in a Discord server that is source of great inspiration and learning. So join today for more Anamorphic Cookbook. See you soon. Fehadings out.